Warning, this podcast has stories of real-life events and true crime that happens every day. These stories may contain adult language and graphic or disturbing details not suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I'm Chuck. And we are back this week. Uh how hey, how was your trip? Um it was it was uh it was okay. Uh could have been um on better uh I guess terms, I guess. Um so I supposed to go out there for a wedding and then a wedding wasn't happening about Wait, what? Before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, is this something we have to hold on to for locker room then? <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to. All right, can. Well, I just so, I had a good time. These bottles back here, uh, I, I got them. We'll talk about that on, on locker room. Uh, I told uh Matt about one of them because I know he's a super big like liquor type of dude, like liqueur, like fucking fancy. Oh, he, he likes he likes fancy. Oh. Talk yeah. about the speakeasies out there. Holy yeah. shit. In the, the distilleries? All right. Well, like, we'll have to get into the distilleries yeah. and the speakeasies on Locker Room. And we'll also have to find out why why you went out, why you flew to Tennessee for a wedding and never went to a wedding. That That's part of the story I can't wait to hear. By so, the way, this is whiskey uh, and vodka. Whiskey and vodka? Isn't that weird? Right? No, I mean, it's just two boozes mixed together. Just told to mix them together. Try uh, Long Island I see. That's like four boozes mixed together. <laughs> anyway. Dave's like D. Yeah. So uh, we are back this week uh, with a guest, with a with a good interview. Uh, and then for those of you that do show up for Locker Room Live, uh, while Matt is away, uh, well, not this week. We have, I got the answer to our question of where was Matt <laughs> last week. Um but while he's away, we're doing uh, Locker Room Live on Thursdays. So no more Wednesday tuning in. Uh, tune in on Thursday. So we'll be, we'll, what are we discussing? We're discussing Flat Earthers. We're discussing why Chuck went to Tennessee and, and nobody got married. And we're going to discuss, um, I think we're going to discuss women overvaluing themselves uh, these days because there's some scandalous stuff that I've, I've discovered women are posting about men or about themselves uh, in, in doing the research into these single mom profiles. But that is not what we have for war stories this week. War stories, we have uh, a really good story this week. So, Chuck, why don't we let's bring our guest in? And Chuck, why don't you tell Absolutely. us a little bit about our guest? Right. So, our guest uh, reached out to us, um, and it was kind of ironic when he did. Uh, I recently just posted a video about um, the Los Angeles County Fire Department getting blown up um, in uh, South LA. Yeah. Right. Um, literally, that was a pretty I, bad propane explosion. Right. That was the dude. natural gas on the truck. Right. Yeah. Holy yeah. fuck, dude. That that firefighter, I watched his body go like this and then out of frame. And I was like, right. oh, he's dead. He's fucking dead. No, he, survived, he survived though. Right? He fucking he's survived getting him. blasted and like in the movies, just getting blown back. But like how that I was like, dude, no, like your insides would have just been bleh, mush. But uh, apparently think? all that gear and shit, the bunker gear just saved his life, I guess. But funny thing he was is that yeah, thank God. I was dude so happy I heard, to hear that he survived and he's in critical but stable condition. And I was like, oh my god, that's what it is. He's out of the he's in critical, but he's not. He's he's not. Uh, he's not on the 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 list he's of those. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Um. So literally looked on. Um. Was just checking. Um. Our email and I saw this and it says firefighter blown up and I was like, I wonder if that has anything to do with. Um. Downtown. So I looked at it. It did not. But. It was interesting because um, of how like close it was and how ironic it was. I was like, oh, definitely. I, I mean, that's just a catchy title anyways. We'll definitely have this guy on. So I read a little bit about it, conversed with him, and <clears throat> basically he was involved in a really nasty explosion. And uh, you're going to be getting photos sent to you so you can put them up. Uh, on oh, wow. um, but yeah, it was pretty You're sending me, you're emailing me photos? Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Okay. I'll, I'll bring up my email so that I can make sure and add those to the show today. Yes. Uh, well, okay, great. Let's 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 welcome our guest, Alex. How are you, Alex? Good. How are you guys? Uh, we are doing better than we have any right to be. I think huh. that's probably the best way to say it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
welcome to the show. Uh, we appreciate your email and you pre- appreciate you uh, chiming in and, and telling us you want to come on. But why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into uh, the fire service, how you got into firefighting, and kind of your journey uh, to becoming a firefighter. So I joined the department right after graduating high school, volunteer department, small town. Pretty much everyone knows everyone here. here. So Mm -hmm. I grew up in two different fire departments. My dad and my grandfather were both fire chiefs at one point in separate departments. And my great grandfather was DNR when they did both as far as the law enforcement side and the fire. Hmm. Okay. So I've I've been a firefighter since 2014. Okay. Okay. Now, how did you so it was a it was just because it was a family business or family tradition or or was it something you always wanted to do or did you did you come to it late? How did you end up No, well, just kind of growing up seeing all the big loud red <laughs> trucks. Looks mm-hmm. cool. And then, yeah. Right. <laughs> oh Plus, no one's shooting a as a firefighter. Right. So, <laughs> uh, I you mean, funny, yeah. The funny, crazy thing is, is that I've talked to so many people, um, not just on here, but other places, like in law enforcement, um, and their biggest thing of why they wanted to be a cop or fire or whatever. A lot of them is consistently, I, I every time I saw someone rolling code. I wanted it to be me because I wanted to know where they're going and I want to go and do with the fun shit they're about to go do. Right. And I was yeah. like, Oh shit. So it's like, they see themselves in that car and they're like, Oh, that looks just so cool. Like that little kid mentality, but it lasted all the way through their life. Yeah. That's kind of what it was. I mean, let's face it. I was asked that our entire Academy class, I should say was asked by our uh, head DI. He said, if you had to do this job wearing a blazer and a polo shirt, driving a Toyota Camry, would you want to? I was like, hell no. <laughs> no dude. What are we, you know, social workers? God. I mean, let's face it. Like, you want to go out with the cherries and blueberries going on top of the car? You want to you wanna get in fights? You want to chase people down? I, I used to, I think I've said it on the show numerous times. I'll do the police work for free. You're going to have to pay me yeah, to do the yeah. paperwork, right? Like, 100%, like if it's yeah. just chasing bad guys and getting into fights and driving code through with my hair on fire. Like that's, that's just fun, you know, but when it comes to like all the other bullshit, then okay. Now we're going to have to talk about paying me to deal with politics, (laughs) paperwork and all that stuff. So you, how old were you when you became a firefighter? 18. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Right right out of high school. Yep. Yep. Now, how does that work for, for your, where you're at? Um, Is it a volunteer do you start out as a volunteer and then progress to full-time or so, do you start out apply for full-time go to the cat how does that work so pretty much you can join any volunteer department in the county you got two years per the state to get qualified go through the training mm-hmm. um oh, well. we only have one full-time department in the county the rest wow. is all volunteer Really? So is it County Fire is the only, is it County Fire that's the full-time? It's actually the city that's kind of centered in the county itself. So the county seat? Yeah, basically has a full-time fire. (laughs) And then everything surrounding, some of them have started going paid on call, partly staff type scenarios, but most part. the, The communities are like poor. Yeah, is it because it's so rural? What, what, yeah, it's, it's just really rural. Right. Okay. I mean, I get that. So we have. So up here, you've got. You know, in in the. I don't know I why this surprises us anymore. I know. I, well, here's the thing. You and I have had the luxury of being police officers in big city areas, and you know, you move out to rural areas. I mean, I told you when I moved up here, there was a there's a a county sheriff in washington state right across the border from us 
And there's 16 people on the sheriff's department. The whole sheriff's department is 16 people. And he once responded to a domestic violence because he was on call in a cement truck and borrowed his buddy's revolver because he didn't have his duty weapon with him. I mean, like that is more common. The United States is a big place, right? And so I, I like when we get guys like Alex on here and stories from guys like Alex on here too, because, you know, it's not all LAPD and NYPD. It's not all, uh, you know, FDNY. It's not all LA County fire. It, you know, those are big agencies and for sure they have, you know, a lot of resources, but you know, what do you do when you have three, we've got a, a we've got a fire department up here. And I've been talking to him because we're working on a, an exercise, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I talked to their fire chief at this meeting and I said, so how many, how many firefighters do you have on it? She goes three. And I said, at each station, she goes, we have, we have one station and we have three firefighters, three full time. They tell people what to do. And then the rest are all volunteers. No, no, no. Three at any given time. That's it. Right. So there's three people on duty. And then they go and they're the first ones on scene and the rest are called up and, you know, called up from the bullpen, either volunteer uh, reserve or guys that are off duty that are willing to get put on the clock. Right. Three. What the fuck? Now they rely, they rely heavily on mutual aid. They rely heavily on other agencies. So I think Alex, I, that sounds kind of like, you know, you're, so how big is your fire department? Uh, as far as the 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 full time part, because you said it's only, it's one full time fire department for the whole county, and then you, you, I'm guessing you have a ton of reserves depending on, you know, uh, what size your county is. I don't know. So that's not even my department. Oh wow! No, they kind of have that situation. I'm pretty sure they have more than three full time <laughs> okay. staff. Yeah, with one fire department, I would hope they would have more than three. Yeah, but it's kind of the same scenario. They have on-call people that'll jump in when they get tones dropped. On top of if it's big enough, they'll pull in their volunteer for that department. Right. My department itself is fully volunteer, and okay. we have eighteen, I believe. Oh wow! Okay, and that's actually a pretty big yeah. volunteer. If you can show up, you can show up. Depending on the time of day, you might get. Five or six guys. That's what I was gonna ask. How many? How many is the average of you when you roll on a call? Well, first let me ask this: how, how what's the average of people staffing the station at any given time because it's a volunteer? And then, um, what is the average uh, response? Uh, people response to the scene. Right. You get one a working fire or something. So part? we have nobody at our department. There's no talk, housing. Talk. Yep. There's no, is there a, where do you keep your gear? At the station or in our vehicles. So you do have a station, but there's yes. no housing at the station. So nobody staffs it. Correct. It's basically a, a warehouse where you go roll up the door. It's a garage. <laughs> you roll up the door, grab basically, the gear. Basically, yeah. Grab the gear, grab the trucks and go. Well, I mean, there you go. Well, right? So how does the 911 calls work? So they probably go to the sheriff's department, don't they? So our dispatch has shares fire and police and EMS. Right. They get the call. They drop the tones. It hits our phones, hits our pagers, whatever we wow. decide to carry with us. And then it's get to the barn, <laughs> get to like the station, get your stuff. <laughs> uh, it's, Where are you at? <laughs> not quite. No. <laughs> It's, more it's, technical. A, it's like an iPhone. It's like an actual use. app on our phones that kicks us out. We can see who's right. responding, the call details, that kind of stuff. Right. Is it reliable? Because it's a cell phone, right? Right. So, so the, the, had instances the, where it's like they didn't have service. Yeah, you better hope you know where you're yeah. going before you get to the trucks, because good majority of our area, as soon as you pull out of the fire barn, you're on your own. Knowing where you're Did going. Did you say fire barn? Yeah. So it's, basically, it's basically a pole barn. We just call it a awesome. fire barn. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Because I just imagine it actually being like a like a big ass barn, barn. Right. <laughs> and you just let's go, boys. Woo! You just <laughs> hop in and just take off, and it's like the Dukes of Hazard. 
We do at least have roll up doors. They're not the slide open doors. <laughs> well, I mean, you think about it back in the day when, you know, fire wagons were horse drawn and Dalmatians were there to make sure the horses were, I, it would have been a barn, right? So I guess right. the idea of I, our agency, we used to say, I'll meet you back at the barn. And barn yeah. was always just the slang for station. But you put that, your blinders on like they would put a horse <laughs> put on a horse. Right, right. right. Put your blinders okay. on and get back to the barn. <laughs> so uh, is it, the first guy up who or the closest man says okay i'm gonna go get the gear or does somebody get assigned to it do you have rank structure how does that work pretty much first come first serve you get there and there's still a truck you take it and you go oh wow and then if Is there's no trucks you go straight right to the scene or do you always have that? To gear? if there's no trucks you go right to the scene and with your gear or do you and you always have it with you or do you have to go get your gear Depends. Some people leave their gear at the station. Some keep them with them in their personal vehicles. Okay. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. So we've established a couple of things. Number one, this is a small agency. Yes. We cover and two townships and it's about 70 square miles. Okay. So 70 square miles. How many firefighters would you say total? If every single person that works for your fire department showed up, how many would you have? 18 to 20, maybe. That's wow. Pretty good. And then that's pretty fuck good. And then anybody that's coming like for mutual aid in a big event, they're going to be 70 miles or 30, I uh, ostensibly 35 miles minimum away. Basically. Yeah. Wow. All right. And they still have to get to their station and get their stuff to come help us. How far are you from the full-time county seat fire department? Um, about 25 minutes. Wow. That's crazy. That's amazing. I but mean, the I, way our stuff structured, they've, I take it back. They've come out and helped us once when we had a big wildfire. We wow. called for the whole county to come help us. On top of some other counties and a lot of DNR. Wow. So, I'm just going to pull up some statistics for okay. people who may be listening who live in Los Angeles. The biggest agency in Los Angeles, I don't know if you're familiar with it, for police is LAPD. Now, because we're two dumb cops, uh, this interests me. And I, I kind of like already kind of figured when he said 80 square miles, I was like, I wonder if that equates to like a normal division size for that big it's one of the biggest agencies in the country right so right. i went and looked and generally the the fire are a lot smaller they're broken up inside of those divisions so it would do no point to look at that so i just want to look at this real quick uh west valley division of los angeles police department after it was changed because if you know anything about history of los angeles uh it used to be a really big division and they broke it up into two because it was um such yeah, a big cares. division <laughs> right anyways it's 33.5 square miles yeah and they have, Smallest? I think when my dad was working there at West Valley, there was, there was, two, it was bigger than that. And there was 250 cops. I think it was 60, 60 something, 60 or 70 square miles. Yeah. And that's close to his, almost his whole two townships. This right. and just put it in perspective, the smallest division in the Los Angeles police department is 6.25 square miles. And it's called Olympic division. And it is the smallest. Like if, if you ever lived in Los Angeles and you've ever gone to Koreatown right there from the freeway, to basically the middle of Koreatown, maybe a little, it's a little bit farther down. Yeah, so nobody right knows. Away. That's have no the idea. whole division, and you <laughs> right. can cross the whole fucking thing multiple times. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Right. It's so not, we're trying to put that in perspective because we want you to understand Alex is working with limited resources, is what we're saying. And vast area. When, when you say there is nobody else, it literally means there is nobody else. What is the population density? What, how, how many people? Would you say you guys serve about 1500? Okay. So at least, so we're talking mm -hmm. rural when you're talking 1500 people in 70 square miles. Yeah. Like you're talking farms, you're talking, everything's really spread out, right? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Lots of farms, yeah. lots of. Put this in area. perspective. Right. That 33.5 square miles that we were just talking about. Yeah. Houses about six, uh, 600,000 people. Right, right. So, so you're talking about a very rural area. 
Well, so you came to this because your family had been in it, <coughs> and you're you're. It was a it was a tradition. You'd grown up watching it. You saw you know guys putting on their turnouts, putting on the helmets, getting on the truck, and going and putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. And you said that's for me. Oh yeah. Do you still now? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the question I want to ask you later. So okay. The question I have for later is, is it still worth it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the floor is yours. I'm very curious because I see these pictures and and I'm I'm curious to paint the picture for me. What happened? So call came out around like it was three thirty in the morning, two thirty, three thirty in the morning for mutual aid. So we had to go into a neighboring township area. Mm-hmm. Pull barn fire. All right. I get out of bed, head down to the fire station, get there. My dad is already there getting in a truck. Wow. Another guy is getting in a truck. I grab my stuff, throw it on, jump in the truck with my dad. Mind you, before I left, I already mapped it out because I'm like, I know the cell service is crap, no GPS. I want to know where we're heading. So I end up navigating for my dad who's driving. We start heading there here down power lines from their first truck there. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting close. I mean, we're, what is it? Five miles away from the fire, I think. From our station. Start getting close. Verify the lines aren't across the road. Nope, they're on the property. All right, cool. We get there. Talk to basically scene command, which is whoever's operating the truck that gets there before you until someone with rank shows up. Figure out what he wants from us. He tells me to go grab a hand line. I go grab it. My dad's supposed to be hooking up water to supply their truck to put water on the fire. All right, cool. Go grab a line. Make sure my hose is out. Got a hold of the nozzle, call for water, watching the water hit the lines. Shit, there's a snag. That instant, as soon as I said, oh, there's a snag, I'm going to go unkink the line. All I heard was a rush of flames, bright light, and lots of heat. Immediately cover my face with my forearms, grabbing the rim of my helmet. Clenched my eyes shut, started to rotate, hit the ground, and stayed down. Felt relief from the heat, popped up, and just was hit by the intense pain to my face, just screaming, my face, my face. Well, me thinking I'd stayed on my feet and just turned and dropped was later explained to me that is not what happened. I turned while being thrown 10 to 15 foot through the air backwards. Oh, wow. Hit the ground, lost my helmet. Believe that's when I got knocked out and had a full sheet of pole barn steel land on my back. Oh, gosh. Wow. Was that from the roof? No, the roof had already collapsed when we pulled up. Oh, wow. Okay. I was informed that, hey, a propane tank already let off over here behind this trailer. I'm like, all right, 20-pound barbecue tank, maybe a 100-pounder. No big deal. I'll start spraying this 300-pound tank that I see in front of me, trying to cool it down. So when I felt the heat and all that, I figured it was that 300 letting loose, and I'm like, this is the end. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead. Right. So then I felt the heat on the back of my neck. Relief. Well, it turns out the guy operating the pump ran over, ripped the steel off of me, and that was the relief of heat I felt. I took up, took off straight at the ambulance where I knew it was. But just before I had kind of come to and felt the heat still on the back of me, a picture of my daughter flashed in my eyes. 
And that was kind of like me snapping out of being knocked out. So you mm-hmm. came to because a picture of your daughter's face went through your mind and then that brought you back to reality? That's the only thing I can think of. Right. As to what had happened. Because I was like, no, I didn't get knocked out. I didn't leave my feet. None of that stuff. You Come timed out? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. Dude, teleported, bro. Yeah, it's crazy and, and how I, the mind works. Right. I'm, you're not the first person I've spoken to on this show. Chuck and I have spoken to a lot of people on the show. You are not even close to being the first person we've spoken to that if t- that is time jumped as a result of a critical incident. <laughs> I'm amazed that I didn't lose my hearing completely because there was a truck coming five miles away that saw the fireball, a truck about a mile out that has... So you got a driver and a passenger, and then behind them, the next line of guys is facing backwards. That guy thought they turned the cab lights on in the truck. That's a big because, explosion. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we had we had one of our guys coming. He was a quarter mile away in his personal vehicle. He thought he was going to lose all the windows in his truck from the blast. <clears throat> Wow. And all I heard was the rush of the fire. So you didn't hear the, you don't remember hearing the blast. Correct. You, the only thing you remember is a whoosh of the fire enveloping you and then getting to your feet from being knocked down and saying, My face hurts. Yeah. But the explosion portion of it and the flying 15 feet portion of it. And the being knocked down mm. and unconscious portion of it are a complete mystery to you to this day. Yes. Other than what I've heard from other people. I wonder if that's because you were so close to it that the sound barrier when it went off, you know, broke behind you. So you didn't get that big loud bang, right? Because when I was right. in the military, we used to blow blow up stuff all the time and being close to it was better than being farther away from it because you would hear it louder farther being farther away and you would feel the shock wave farther away like pretty gnarly and you're like whoa but being up close to it it's like it was a lot more calm i guess but and you were like right out there in the open how did you not get hit by any type of shrapnel or anything like well, that? we did it was a black, giant piece of steel luckily well, <laughs> it stayed intact <laughs> well I mean, yeah, it been smaller say. pieces there were because the only parts of that tank they found were the it was a 250 pound vertical propane tank. Yeah, so we haven't gotten to what caused this. So let's I guess we should just get into that. So so you get knocked on your butt. What happened? Apparently there was a 250 pound propane tank sitting just behind a two axle dump trailer. That dump trailer was between me and that tank. To this day, that is 100% what saved my life. It completely caved in the one side of that trailer, shoving it six to eight foot sideways. That's about a 3,000 pound. Yeah, that's about a 3,000 pound trailer. Wow. So what had happened is all of the shrapnel went up and over using that trailer as a ramp. It shot the fender off of that trailer 80 foot in the air and stuck it in the ground on the other side of the road. Wow. They ended up finding shrapnel of the center of that tank in the hay field beyond that fender. So if not for the trailer absorbing most of the impact, you'd be dead. 100%. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, so let's... I have the trailer picture, so let's let's show this, and you can explain to our listeners what we're looking at. Um, Or I guess I should say viewers, because the listeners won't be able to see it. So those of you who aren't on YouTube, go on YouTube if you want to see this. Uh, Chuck, I'm sure, will post pictures on our social media, so if you follow us there. So... This is a dump trailer? Yes. The whole and, section of it 
is hydraulic and will dump it out the back, whatever's in it. Mm -hmm. Solid steel. Yeah. This is like like a dumpster, like a giant steel dumpster on hydraulics that can dump. Basically. Wow. This thing looks quite like it can. Oh, yeah. Uh, why isn't the other propane tank messed up? Did you guys move it? No. That, that tank is, it takes equipment to move that kind of a tank. Right. It looks like it's in a concrete foundation. It's just, well, I mean, it's really, is that the one that blew? No. No, the one that blew was vertical. The, okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I was explaining okay. that propane right. tanks are pretty robust, right? Like, it's going to take a lot for a propane tank to rupture in a fire. So clearly, whatever was happening with this vertical one was was crazy, and you're going to explain. This one was, I guess, luckily far enough away and didn't take enough damage to catastrophically fail? Correct. So okay. anything under 500 pounds, I believe it is, there's no requirement on how far away from a building it has to be. So right. that was taken advantage of, and this 250 was right up against the side of the pole barn. Wow, oh, got it. Because this thing, this truck flew. This 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 uh, dump truck or dump trailer flew, moved. Yes. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. That's this is oh, where fuck. this is where it came to rest. Yes. Oh, okay. How is your insides not like mush? Like that's the only question. Like it's crazy. Like that's the only question. <laughs> Dude, like i don't know how are you not mush like well so it, it, from what it looks like clearly this is not the side you were on of the dump trailer right like this no this, that the, is the on that side. opposite side yes and that dump trailer acted almost like so you had you have a big steel side and then you have a gap right the dump trailer gap and then i'm yes. assuming there's there's some damage but relatively minor because basically that steel side absorbed a lot of the velocity of the impact. And then that other steel side caught the rest of it. And whatever got you was overpressure that crept around the sides and the top of it. Or it maybe the dump, the dump trailer smacking into you and knocking you back. Which in and of itself is amazing wow. that you're, you're not dead because a steel dump trailer smacking you like a whack-a-mole can't be fun dude yeah as far as i know where i was standing to start with that trailer still hadn't reached that point mm -hmm. so i know i didn't get hit by the trailer okay so the trailer kind of it would then it was what i said which is the overpressure and the shock wave coming around the air pressure yeah. and the flames coming around it and the debris and whatever was shielded for the most part except for what was the giant steel plate was that what what part of the structure was that? Do we know? That is that's part of the propane tank. That it was other oh. pitcher. Oh wow. No, no, yeah, no. That, the steel plate that landed on your back. Oh no, no, no. That was uh pole barn steel. So it was, it was just a full sheet of tin, basically, is what it is. Okay. Got it. So it was hot, but it wasn't heavy. Right. Okay. All right. So because I, I I was not sure how so that must have just come up and over and then landed on top of you in an arc versus an explosion driving it into you with mass and force. Right. Okay. So now you're on the other side of this. And ish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you come sort of come to, right? Right. And you see this image of your daughter's face. Yep. And you don't realize what happened to you. Walk us through realizing what you had just been through and then going and getting treatment and all that. Because I think now you've got two two critical incidents, right? You've got the, the barn that's on fire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then you've had this catastrophic explosion that has now created at least one casualty. Were you the only casualty? Yes. Okay. There was one other guy that got a little bit of spray back from his hose, but... He didn't even go to the hospital. Sure. Okay. So you you're in you're legit injured, obviously, and we have a picture of that when we get to that portion. But that, you're legitimately injured, and everybody's responding now to you, right? 
they're kind of like, like their attention is diverted from the fire itself to holy crap one of our guys is down and your father's there yes. right he was luckily on the other side of a truck when it happened i got up and met him just before i got to our truck heading to where i knew that ambulance was because i knew it was bad he met me and i told him help me get this damn coat off because so i already had half my stuff stripped off and i didn't unconsciously did it right so you said help me get this damn coat off but your damn coat was already off i had one sleeve left on one sleeve left on okay so you're you're struggling you're trying and you're like come on dad this this thing's pissing me off and he still has absolutely no idea what the hell happened. He literally he just, just shock the boom. He you just heard, heard the boom bang and, and then saw me heading that way and looked at my face and was like, oh God. Right. And just started helping me. Right. Well, at that point, there's no time to say what the hell happened. There's only time to act. Right. Yeah. So now, now you're was, was, helping you get your coat off. Yep. Got to the ambulance. Well, I was actually waving the ambulance to me because yeah. they were still turning around to get back closer to the scene where it had happened hmm. so that I didn't have to walk another 100 yards to get to the ambulance. Yeah, that would suck. Touchdown. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was the uh, the burns to your face, were they uh, primarily second degree or any any third or... They told me I had slight third, not enough to get graphs or any of that stuff. It was right, right. there at that borderline. Right. So right. Lot, you Just were being be fortunate. Important. Yes. Because Just they debated. Be painful, but not to kill your fucking nerves. Right. Not to completely kill them. Right. Because <laughs> later on, the feeling of those regrowing is that's something different. Believe me, I know. <laughs> yeah chuck's been burned i've been burned i just i was young enough where i don't have the same pain memories that you two probably do i fell into a fire pit when i was about four so i have i have memories of being treated and i have memories of it hurting but i don't actually have memories of pain if that makes sense but yeah. chuck yeah. and you i'm sure still recall the actual excruciating pain that yeah. fire number one and then nerves regrowing number two uh so your dad's helping you. Yep. The ambulance comes over and they just, I'm guessing they just wrap you up and hot, hot load you and off you go. How long is that trip? So actually the other guy that got was operating the other hose ended up climbing in there too, because it knocked him off his feet. This was a 40 by 80 pole barn and he was mm -hmm. at the opposite end and it threw him. It threw the firefighter operating the pump into the truck itself and gave him some sores and bruises as well. He ended up getting like a slight sunburn almost. He just ended up with a red face from the heat that far away. Okay. He was probably about 150, 200 foot away from the building. Oh, wow. Okay. And you were how far? I was somewhere within probably 50 foot. Right. So there's a big difference in the, the how wow. far you're away and how far he's away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So you guys both end up in the ambulance. Is this the only yep. ambulance? Yes. The only ambulance that's there. Only which Well, we were lucky because that mutual aid department has an EMS that's staffed full time. Otherwise, we have to wait anywhere from 15, 20 minutes for an ambulance to show up to any of our calls. Oh, wow. Wow. So you could have been waiting 15, 20 minutes after you'd been burned. Yes. That would have been bad. Crazy. The From when we checked in on scene to when the Mayday got called for the explosion was damn near five minutes on the dot. Wow. Okay. So now how long is the ambulance ride to the hospital? And do you guys have a burn unit? Do you like what I'm assuming so you're going to go towards the county seat because that's probably got the, the best facility. Mm -hmm. 
No, they transferred me out of county. Oh wow. Okay. I went like to the bigger city. Bigger city. Yeah. Area. Yeah. So I ended up going north one county. And they were debating in the ambulance on the way up there if I was gonna have to get flown downstate to an actual burn unit. Oh wow. How long was that ride? Because I know what being burned feels like. I know how it can feel from third degree, second degree, and first degree, right? They're all varying degrees of pain except for third degree because it burns your shit off until later in debrisment when it starts getting into the stuff and yada, yada, whatever. Yeah, right. Later. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> you're probably in excruciating pain. It probably feels like your whole face is melting off of you. Um, what are they doing to mitigate that while you're in the back of that ambulance? And how painful was it? And did you ever lose consciousness of from the pain or anything like that? Or was it kind of like a blur? So I didn't lose consciousness from the pain. However, Just from I do, the initial blast. I think I knocked myself out with my wrist when I hit the ground because of how I had my arms. Got it. Oh, because you said you put them up. Right. Right. So I never lost consciousness in the ambulance from the pain. However, I do think that I might have went into some sort of shock because, yeah, I was feeling it, but not like I was right out of the gate initially. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, no, we had to meet up with a paramedic unit because that was only a basic. Oh. And I remember they had to tape my eyes shut because they were worried that I'd get stuff in my eyes. Before we left, I went, wait, can I try and take my contacts out? Because I know this oh. isn't going to go well if I don't get them out now. It's like, yeah, right. if you can get them out, get them out. No idea how I did it, but I got them out. Then they taped my eyes shut. We started taking off. The medic unit that they were calling for that's contracted with them, I probably had to wait. 10, 15 minutes before our, the medic would be on board and I'd start getting painkillers. Luckily, a different agency was listening to radio traffic at the time and was headed to another hospital to do a transfer. And like, hey, we're right around the corner. Do you want us to take this? Uh, so hell like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they jumped that call and got on board, started treating me. And... Even before I had the meds on board, I was cracking jokes. Right. I'm yeah, like, the shock cause, to kick in, yeah. Because they're talking about hooking me up to a 12 lead, and he's like, You got a razor? I'm like, Well, at least you're not going to wax me to put these patches on. Yeah. Now, do you remember deliberately making jokes, or was this just kind of, are you just a natural jokester? Or were you do were you joking to kind of alleviate the awkwardness? What I'm just curious because we've tomb, gallows humor, tombstone humor is obviously a defense mechanism we've talked about on the show more times. Yeah. Than, you know, but I'm curious to know what was going through your mind when you heard yourself making joke in light of the circumstances. Because at this point, you don't know how bad it is, right? Right. I haven't seen it. I haven't touched it. Because I didn't want to touch it. And honestly, I didn't know if I wanted to see it. Right. Right. So I honestly, I don't know. I was like, well, I'm still alive. I can't see shit because my eyes are taped over. Might as well make the best of it and just start cracking jokes. Yeah. And you, do you, you probably, do you think you were thinking that because you're like, man, I just need to try to get my mind off of the, the scary shit that just happened or is going to happen because you don't know what's what's wrong with your face? Honestly, the part that scared the shit out of me the most was how the hell am I going to call my wife and explain this? Bro, oh, I remember the same thought. I'm like, oh, man, my wife's going to kill me. With our eight-month-old at home. Oh, wow. Yeah, even worse. My, my, my only thought, because I was going through divorce, was my girlfriend's going to leave me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's isn't it weird how that's, that's the thought, right? It's not about ourselves. It's about our significant how much trouble we're going to be in right or or is she going to be mad or is she going to be upset right or 
it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic. So I ended up, luckily my dad ended up being able to ride with me in the ambulance. Oh, that's good. He made those calls for me before he even got on the ambulance. So <laughs> being small town rural, it just so happens to work out that we live next door to my parents. Oh, oh wow. that's nice. That's so helpful. my mother had to go wake up my wife. Scared to so shit out of her. Your mom and your mom ran next door. Yep. Calling my wow. mother-in-law on the way there saying, you need to come watch the daughter. Something happened. I need to take her to the hospital with me. Wow. My mom I mean, scared that's, to that's fortunate. She scared the shit out of my wife, which then scared the shit out of my daughter. Later on, once I was home, she ended up with night terrors every other night. Your little one? Yes. Got it. That's right. sad. That that was probably the worst part out of this whole experience. So what was it what was it about the visit from your mother specifically? Was it do you think just, and, and, and I'm just I'm I'm honestly genuinely curious. Have you guys talked about it since and gone, yeah, we probably should have handled that differently? Or was it just the nature of, of how it went down? What was it specifically that ended up being so ter terrible about the notification process? Because the notification process itself can be traumatizing. Right. I think it was more or less that my wife wasn't expecting to hear a female voice shaking her, trying to wake her up. Oh, so oh. your mom was in a panic and she's waking your wife out of a dead sleep. And yes. she's in the house. She's like, I'm, I'm coming yeah. in. No, we're not knocking the, on the door. <laughs> it's just... right. right. It would be one thing if she just pounded on the door and your wife had slowly, you know, come out of a deep sleep and then gone to the door and had time to get to her senses. But this was from dead asleep to panicked, shaking, get up, get up, get up. Yes. Yeah. And then what about your daughter? She was, so when my phone went off, it kind of woke her up. So the wife just brought her into bed because it's like, oh. do I really want to fight this? So she was right next to your wife. Yes. Mm. Wow. I can tell. She, she said four. What's that? Did you say four? Eight months. Oh, wow. Okay. I, for some reason, I thought four years old, but you're saying eight months old. Yes. Wow. And and then the infant was having night terrors. Yes. Wow. Well, let's take a look at what you looked like when she got to the hospital, shall we? Because at some point you decided to see what you looked like and you took a selfie. And uh, I'm not going to lie, you're a little swollen. <laughs> That's not when I got to the hospital. <laughs> oh, when is that? That was the next day. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Wow. No, it wasn't the next day. It was later on in that day because they were just dumping IV into me, trying to hydrate me, keep me comfortable, replenish that kind of stuff. Well, they might have went a little overboard and my face started to swell. From hydrating you? Yes. So that eye, my left eye was completely swollen shut. My right eye was almost completely shut to the point of I could start feeling painful pressure on my left eye. Oh, wow. When did they debris it? Um, they did half ass did it when I got to trauma. And pretty much what's there is what my wife had to debris off me once we got home. Fucking serious? Yes. So this, this is okay. So this is, this is not the first time. So like when I, I got burned, I went to the local trauma center. And they're they don't know what they're doing with burns. They may be able to save someone from a gunshot, but when it comes to burns, they drop the ball so fucking big. And it's I'm sorry you had to deal with that because that is fucking ridiculous and painful, and you shouldn't have to deal with that. They did the same shit bullshit to me until I went to a burn center, and then I got really debrided there, like that right there. I was assuming you know they probably debrided you afterwards and peeled all the skin off, and you know maybe I don't know something more than that because that can lead into infections and nasty shit. That's crazy. It, the way they deemed it was if it doesn't come off with regularly cleaning it, 
which was a saline and gauze pad, that um, it would end up scarring. Okay. Right. So that's how they left the instructions we were left with. Oh, that looks painful. Yeah. And honestly, I never really felt pain before I left the hospital. I was on Tylenol for pain management. Really? Do, what, what, do you think it was partially shock that was keeping you from pain? Or do you think it was the nerves in shock or the nerves being singed and, and then growing back? What, what, what do you attribute it to? Honestly, I have no idea. Right. It's one of those, like, I've, it just happened. Yep. That's, dude, that's okay. So when it goes to the third degree, it turns black, but like some of your, like your skin is starting to slough. So I could see that severe second. So it's singeing some of the nerves, which is kind of helping in the pain management, but it's going to hurt really bad it's really quick down the road. But damn, like, that's pretty gnarly. Like, wow. Yeah. Ugh. Does not look fun, that's for sure. No eyebrows. Yeah, they're back now. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. So, how long ago was this? This was December thirtieth. Wow. Okay, so this Ooh, is of last new. year. Yes. Holy shit! This was only two months ago. Thirtieth. Wow. Okay. Happy New Year. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. So what? Uh, I got a couple questions real quick. What was the cause of the fire? Unknown. Was it ever determined? Unknown, but after the blast, the homeowner decided yeah. to inform us that, oh, by the way, that's my welding corner. I have a bunch of welding tanks in there. Uh, hmm. Great. Right. They found an oxyacetylene torch set just inside the building from where that tank was originally my so guess the oxyacetylene that went and then ruptured the giant propane tank my guess is because my full-time job is a welder so my experience with that is that acetylene tank failed or it wasn't mm. shut off that knocked over when the roof collapsed and was sitting there shooting flames straight at that tank yeah well did the tank open <laughs> Catastrophic failure and yeah. wow. shitty yeah, luck. So how's the pain now? Virtually gone. I have a Is little. There ever... What's that? Oh, okay. keep continue. I have a little bit of sensitivity in the tip of my nose to pressure, and my left ear still has some issues with it. As far yeah. as sensitivity, or as far as hearing, or. Um, just the top of my left ear is sensitive to pressure, but hearing wise, uh, loud and high pitched noises are terrible on it, sure. which having a child under one years old, that <laughs> is amazing. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. Was it, was that the side that was facing towards the explosion? No, but that's oh, the side that took the worst of it. Interesting. Could you turn? So my right side was facing the building when it went off, but my left it, side ended up with the worst of it. Probably, as Chuck said, it's probably due to turn. You turned, you know, and your opposite side gets exposed potentially. I, I, I would be curious to know why, but yeah, that's where that I'm sheet, talking. that sheet metal fell on top of your face and just started cooking it. It landed on my back. Oh, yeah. No, it, is, it yeah. scorched all my hair, left burn marks in the back of my fire coat. Wow. Did you frame that thing? I have it hanging up in the garage. Nice. <laughs> Along with yeah, the helmet. That's gonna be done. Attaboy. Okay, you have to send us pictures of the helmet. All right. We've got to see the helmet. Wow. That's, I mean. Was there ever any point that you're like, this is fucking unbearable pain? Like, what the fuck? When I first got okay. up. Off the ground. Other than that, that was it. Yeah. Holy shit! It's crazy. I mean, fortunate. Fortunate. Yeah. Fortunate. That's fucking nuts. That's now like your dad's there. Yep. Mom gets the call. Your mom has to wake up your wife. Your wife gets 
traumatized by getting woken up. Your daughter's got night terrors. How are they dealing with it? So my daughter's gotten better with the night terrors. They're few and far between now. My wife still doesn't like to hear the story or talk about it. Yeah. Whereas me, I think my coping mechanism for it, I think, is to continuously talk about it. Makes sense. Right. Sometimes, so it's interesting. Some people, some people close up and don't want to talk about it. And other people, like, they just need to keep, they just need to get it out to the point where sometimes people say, that's all you talk about. That's all you talk about. That's all you need to move on. And and it's interesting that that's, there's two, there's very different ways. There's not just two, there's right. multiple, but you know, there's a category of, I don't want to talk about it at all. And then there's the category of, I need to get it out. I need to, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around it. And the only way to wrap my brain around it is to verbalize it. Yes. Now, have you had any issues after that? First part question. Second part, have you returned to work or returned to volunteering? So I have not been cleared to go back to volunteering yet. Got it. Well, I've partially been cleared. I can drive and operate the pump. But that being said, part of my healing process is I have to avoid UV light or sunlight for a year to the day. And I can see you've got a you've got some sort of a like a salve or a cream or, or a lotion on your face now. Is that you're going to be putting that on all the time, constantly? Yeah, to keep it hydrated. Right, right. For the next year, basically. So you go out yeah. when you go out. It's it's all like sun hats and and you know i look like i'm ready to rob a bank yeah right you the unabomber every time you go out <laughs> right. he's an invisible man he's got all the bandages uv 700 sunscreen like paint um <laughs> mentally what did that do for you um and uh, did you have any have you had any issues did you have any issues shortly after did anything happen like have you had any any like um I guess, post-traumatic stress issues or anything like that from that explosion or dealt with anything? So the sleep portion of it was pretty bad for a while leading up after it. It was every time I closed my eyes, it was, let's start the video all over again every time, every night. What did you do to, to help um, mitigate that? I just kind of let it play through and analyzed it. Could I have done this? Could I have done that? Well, what if this had happened or what if that? Basically, I what if it to death. Right. right. And, and you're probably, it's probably fair to say you're probably still dealing with stuff residual from there um, mentally. Right. Honestly, it probably hit me just last week what actually could have happened right really just last week yes other than that it's been so for about two weeks i would get an insane adrenaline dump from talking about it to anybody mm -hmm. that died off and it kind of turned into just a normal fire department story do you think you you wanted to keep talking about it to normalize it and get rid of that adrenaline dump or um, I'm curious because I, I get the same thing where I, I talk about certain things sometimes and I start to, I start to amp myself up right. and then I'm like, okay, I don't, uh, part of me, part of me, <laughs> there's a, there's a sick part of you that gets addicted to being amped up and you get like, like you're re-experiencing things and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you realize afterwards you're like, yeah, but that does terrible things to me. Right. So wow. what's some of your coping mechanisms now that might be able to help someone else? I know you said you just started, started hitting you like two weeks ago. So what are you doing now that maybe is helping you? Or if, not, if, if it isn't, then, you know, it's not. But So I was actually at my full-time job when it happened. I borderline debated on just leaving work and coming home to my wife and my child because all I could – do was think about, I just need to hug them right now. Right. Got it. 
But as far as coping, I just been talking about it with people that are in the field, in the department. Sure. Stuff like people that understand. Got it. Along with being open and communicating with my wife. Well, and that's a, that's a big part of it, right? Is yeah. communicating with your significant other. And I don't know if you're a man of faith or anything, if you have religion in your life or whatever, but also I, to me, understanding forces outside of yourself and understanding that it's not about you. It's not about what's happening right now. There's, there's, there's larger forces at work. And you know, the phrase this too shall pass is both a blessing and a curse. If it's good, don't get used to it because eventually it'll go away. And if it's bad, take heart because eventually it'll go away, you know? Right. So I think, it, I think those are important. It was definitely one of those. My job on this earth is not done yet. My right. time is not, my time's not up yet. So do you think you are going to go back? I have full intentions. I have full intentions on going back once I'm fully cleared. Good. And you won't know, right? Until you, until you go back, until you're cleared to go back, until you get back. I had a buddy of mine was buried underneath. We've had him on the show. Roof collapsed, building collapsed. Like every, all these things collapsed on him. Went back to work. And then eventually he got tired of being sent into empty structures to risk their lives for something that they could just let burn to the ground. Right. And that was what got him. It wasn't, it wasn't the firefighting necessarily. It was the burden it took on his family and the nonsensicalness that sometimes people take unnecessary risk. You know? Right. So I think that's one of the biggest contemplations in, in first response. Whether it be the, the the level of risk for like no reward, like no one's there for firefighters, you're just going into what a, a abandoned structure to what help save it when you could just let it burn to the ground and not risk potential losing someone's life. And then you have like law enforcement where they're like, oh well, I'm just going to keep getting berated by my agency for doing the right thing. You know, right. why keep putting up with this BS? You know, I think that's a lot of what we deal with. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know Tom asked you a question at the very beginning yep. um, of this. Uh, and I'm kind of curious to, to know your answer. Yep. So as now. we close it up, I got to know, is it worth it? Definitely. There you go. I there mean, go. I, I, I can honestly say the same thing, right? Like I wouldn't trade any of the experiences I've been through for all the tea in China or all the tea in Boston mm -hmm. Harbor. And there's a sick part of me that every day misses it and wants to go back. And I'm sure you're, you're probably, if I'm going to, I'm guessing you're itching to go back. you got something to prove. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is not it. This is not over. Like I'll, I will show you that this, you know, this is not what, this is not what you do to me. This is not what does me in. This is not what puts me on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Well, Alex, I appreciate you coming on. Do you have any parting words or anything you want to say to our listeners or, or young people or, 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 or firefighters that have been injured that are struggling or, or, or anything that you can share from what you've learned? The biggest thing I've learned is do not get complacent. We go to so many of the same thing over and over, treat it the exact same way. You get comfortable. Comfortable can kill you in this line of work. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, you didn't expect a propane tank to just completely blow you 15 feet in the air and like, oh, propane tanks don't explode. That's 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 what happens in movies. Well, turns out they still can. Mm -hmm. So, good advice. Well, is whenever we have a guest, we want to let our guest give a chance, especially with war stories. Uh, when somebody shares a story, we want to dedicate the episode to someone who has uh, fallen in the line of duty or, or has lost their life uh, as a result of uh, serving others. So I understand you have a dedication for this episode. Yes. It's from a neighboring department. It was April 15th, 2015. Firefighter. John Stanley Sr., who unexpectedly died two days after a fire. 
if he knew you, if he didn't know you, he treated you like family. He has been and is still missed dearly by the community and his fellow firefighters. It's always the good ones, right? Well, rest easy, brother. We've got it from here. Uh, Alex, thank you for coming on. Chuck, do you have uh, anything as we, as we finish? Yes. Out? I just want to say thank you, Alex. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for telling your story. Um, I know it's not easy to deal with, especially when it just happened. Um, and we're glad that you're here with us because you probably shouldn't be. Um, what happened is was crazy. And you have to gift it every day from God that you have. And um, I'm sure you're going to live it to the fullest. Um, thank you, everyone, for today for listening. If you like today's podcast and the content we provide, please help us out by rating and review us. You can rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or really whatever platform you listen to. Our podcast is available on ma all major streaming platforms as well as on our YouTube, which you could watch us right now or you are watching us right now. Let's um, hope you're watching us right now. Come on. Yeah, let's hope, let's hope so. <laughs> if you like today, um, uh, also please follow us on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Our Instagram is at war underscore stories underscore official. And our Facebook is at war stories podcast. You can also support us by going to our website, www.warstoriesofficial.com and grab some gear. Um, if you want to be featured on the show or you think you have a story to tell or you want to tell the story but you don't want to come on, go to booking.warstories at gmail.com. Again, that is booking.warstories at gmail.com. Um, and if you already follow us on our Instagram and Facebook, if you forget, it's a link in the bio. You can click it and you can get to the booking thread uh, or the booking email as well as the uh, if you just have questions that you want to be answered, you can go to the mailbag for War Stories right there. Um, we are always looking for veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, medics, corrections dispatchers and nurses if you have a friend who you think would be a great fit let them know about us give them our information through the booking email or instagram or facebook all that stuff maybe show them some uh spotify or apple music uh podcasts that we have that maybe are some of your favorites and uh hook us up and um i can get them booked and, and uh safe. you can go you can go for those of you looking for back episodes because i know google well actually google podcast is going away like it's they're not really? going to support it anymore. Yeah, Google Podcasts is going to go bye bye. So you can follow us on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, Pandora, all the all the big major podcasting platforms. YouTube. Uh, we are going to be merging locker room social media and War Story social media because it's just too it's too crazy to run them both, and they both the show is runs on the same channel. So uh, if you don't follow us over. If you're following us on Locker Room and don't follow us over on War Stories, head over to War Stories and give us a follow on War Stories. Um, we'll be giving you that warning a bunch of times. Same thing with Facebook, uh, Instagram, you know, all that stuff. We're going to merge it all. And if you have ideas uh, on on if we should, we're looking at what should we change the name of the show, right? Should we do a War Stories is 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 the type of episode and the Locker Room is the type of episode. And then we go with another overall arching name for the show uh, because we do two, two different styles of episodes. So this is just things we're considering. Uh, if you have ideas, those of you who have been listening to us for a long time, listening to us for a short time, whatever, we appreciate you both. Tell us, let us know. We'll see you Thursday for Locker Room Live. And until our next episode, come home with your shield or on it.